Greetings folks, continuing our uh, journey of data science to the next module which is nothing but evaluating the input data guys, okay. So in the process of evaluating the input data what we would like to do is, you know, which file types are commonly used for input and output, you know, we may have raw data, we may have structured, unstructured or different kinds of data, what is the data that we need as input and from that data how do we process and what do we get out of the output or uh, in, in what form we would like to get as it uh, as an output, uh, would our um, third party application consume? Uh, the data coming out of our application in the form of XML versus a CSV versus a JSON file is what it is about. What are the advantages and disadvantages of these file types? We will just have a quick look at them. Several ways to examine the data on the command line and at scale. If you have small amounts of data, what do you do? How do you process versus if you have multiple terabytes of data, how would you go ahead and uh, process that data? Or what kind of sampling would you use? How you would go ahead and sample and uh, what are sampling strategies, how do you filter the data and how can you improve the processing, what data quality problems are uh, commonly used and how we can fix them, these are all part of the evaluating the input data. Let us go ahead and have a quick look at them guys. So, we will start with the data formats, data comes in many formats, it might be structured, unstructured, you know example of structured data is data in database, example of unstructured data is your resume text or maybe plain text uh, in a text document or a Word document and then you and then we have the semi-structured data which is the JSON or the XML. If you notice there is some structure uh, associated or attached to it but it need not necessarily have a hierarchy, uh, it does have a hierarchical structure, it does not necessarily give us the complete information about the data. So, data comes in many formats and the structure and encoding is used to represent the information. It is primarily important at three points in the process guys, okay. So, when we have some data coming there are three main points, one is you know, how do you get the input, well, once you get the input how do you transform it and uh, get some process data, once the process data is ready well, what is it you would like to go ahead and get the output out of the process data is what it is. So, format of the data provided to you or collected by you, we may collect the data somebody else, we may also have a data ingestion team actually collecting the data and just passing it over to us. So, it might be a responsibility and that is really what happens in the real world, we might end up having a separate data ingestion team who will go ahead and maintain the data and separate the, uh, in, in acquiring the data or getting the data. If it is being collected by us, is it small data, is it big data, if it is small data then uh, we can go ahead and save it to a small local file system, but if it is huge amounts of data you know how do we go ahead and put it, should we put it in local file or multiple nodes or why not use something like a Hadoop um, is what it is and format used as input to the analysis. Once you get the data, what is the input, would you like to transform it, would you like to change it into a certain format before you start analyzing your data, that is also referred as the pre-processing or the cleaning stage guys, okay. And then once we format produced as output, once we complete our analysis or advanced analytics, how do we go ahead and and uh, uh, as I like to save the output so that you know maybe our output is consumed by a rich visualization tool such as ClickView, Tableau uh, or Spotfire and these uh, it is much more easier for them to view if it is a CSV file versus an XML file, we can get a easier uh, better visualization and things like that. So, what is the output that we would like to go ahead and uh, get out of our input data is another uh, point. Some formats are better suited to certain users than the others. So, some applications may require a CSV versus some may require an XML or a JSON. Data is sometimes converted to other formats during processing. So, actually to be frank more than sometimes data is mostly uh, converted to other formats and things like that and as part of the uh, that would be the part of the uh, part of our responsibility to hand over or give the data in the format that they would need or require. Some formats map to a relational model more than the others. So, some would like to just go ahead and get the data transferred to a database. So, if you are dealing with big data and things like that, that is where Scoop comes in, it will allow us to transfer the data from HDFS to any relational database or a data warehouse and have it saved in the data base uh, is what it is. Moving on log files, log files are generated by the other applications and services. Um, if you have web application, you know any time a user comes and access or web application, their IP address, date, time and other things are being tracked is what happens. Similarly, the web servers, the uh, mails and cell phones generate a lot of log data and all this log data uh, can be used for analyzing and performing advanced analytics. Data scientists view logs as valuable sources of information. So, this is the uh, new 
uh, idea of uh, the unstructured data. The logs are becoming one of the most important sources of analyzing and finding some very useful insights is what it is. They contain data that is too expensive to store in a transactional DB. It is just that the amount of data which gets logged into these log files is so huge that if we try to save that into a traditional database in a very short period of time, it really uh, increases exponentially is what happens guys. Okay, Data is available immediately no need to wait for ETL process. ETL stands for extract, transform and load. Generally when you have multiple applications in an organization, multiple applications have multiple databases and uh, data from multiple databases is collected and uh, saved to a, a data warehouse. So it goes through the process of uh, ETL is what they refer to where, uh, where we in a database we maintain the transactional data. Again transactional data is something which we would like to update and delete and things like that. Whereas in a data warehouse we maintain the read only data. In other words, it is just append only data and we would we would uh, ideally use a data warehouse data for reporting purposes and things like that. And here the data is append only, we do not modify it. So from multiple databases we are getting the data, we so, uh, save it to a data warehouse. The process of getting the data from multiple databases is referring as, is referred as extracting the data. Then we may want to do some calculations on that data and create new columns or maybe modify a few columns and things like that and then load it into our data warehouse. That is what we mean by transformation and the loading of the data guys. Okay? So log analysis does not require putting load on production system. So when we are referring to the logs and things like that, it is not necessary for us to go through the process of ETL because they are just log data and we can analyze them on raw data. And another issue with the database and data warehouse is that they are expensive and log data need not be uh, necessarily saved on expensive servers or the analytics need not be performed on expensive servers. So in other words, it bring, brings down the cost of uh, analyzing the log data. In other words, there is a scope for us to lower at low cost we can yet perform advanced analytics is what it is. So here what we are showing here is you know, uh, we are just taking the top snapshot of the log file and then we are going ahead and doing some transformations where we are extracting certain informations by doing a cut and cut and extracting maybe the first column which is IP address and maybe the fifth or the sixth column out of a log file. Okay? So this is the kind of data that we would generally have in log files. And uh, moving on then we have fixed width and uh, delimited text files. Uh, fixed width is generally the, uh, the data which comes from the uh, mainframes and things like that. Uh, tends to have fixed width whether they have data or you know characters and uh, not. They generally tend to have some fixed width. So how do you deal with them right? And then we have the delimited text files. Delimited text files is your CSV files or maybe uh, you know whatever delimiter you, your standard uh, process uh, maintains across an application are referred as the delimited text files. Data is sometimes provided as an as uh, fields in text files. So these delimited files ideally would have each field may be separated by a comma. So whatever you have separated by a comma refers maybe refers to a, a column in a database and common data common for data exported from databases or spreadsheets. So generally when in an analytics world, when the analytics begins, when you are a data scientist, you come in, you, you want to go ahead and perform some analytics, you may be given a snapshot of the data either from a spreadsheet or in the form of spreadsheet and the data may be coming from a database or data warehouse saved as a spreadsheet or maybe a CSV file. Uh, typically one record per line, each row is saved as one row and uh, multiple rows together form. Uh, huge log files and things like that. Multiple variants, two main variants are fixed width and delimited. Fixed width, field starts at position and M and occupies in characters. So each field has maybe 10 or 20 characters of uh, width and you may have a small string in the, instead of 10, uh, 10 bytes you may just uh, take about 3 bytes but yet that space is still left off as blank and things like that. So we are always, always defining the width. Uh, the width is always fixed irrespective of not whether that uh, field is filled or not refers to the fixed width. Delimited as discussed you know they are comma separated files or semi comma uh, colon separated files and it may depend on your application standards that are being maintained at your own. Uh, business guys. Okay, Moving on CSV files can be deceptively difficult to parse. In certain scenarios it may be 
uh, difficult to parse this CSV. There is a specification, but few follow it exactly. It is not necessary that everybody follow the same standard or the practice. So, in scenarios where your CSVs are not following such kind of standards, we, we need to be extra careful in going ahead and extracting the right information. So, variations on quoting, embedded commas, missing fields are some of the issues that or standards that may or may not be necessarily uh, be followed in creating these CSV files. So, what we are looking at here is the cut, uh, cut will just go ahead and extract a few columns from um, either the fixed width file or any other CSV or the tab separated files and then we are performing extracting a few columns is what we are doing here guys. Okay. Moving on, the other form is the XML or the HTML. Data is commonly made available either in XML, HTML or JSON formats. If you go to the Twitter, your, your data gets exposed in the form of uh, JSON. If you might uh, go to Reddit, you know your data is exposed in the form of XML um, and then generally uh, companies have their own web APIs and web services available where they provide the data as a service is another form of uh, exposing the data. And once we, uh, when we have these web APIs and web services, it is much more easier uh, for us to get the data than rather than having the data exposed in the form of HTML. Some companies may decide not to expose their data in the form of HTML because of their company's uh, terms and conditions. In such cases, web scraping or screen scraping comes to our rescue and we need to use, we need to be familiar with those techniques guys. Okay? Neither is an ideal format for analysis at scale. So, when we are performing analysis at scale, XML or HTML tends to be very, very verbose. So, what we need to do, we will need to go ahead and extract the right information out of this source information and get only those things. So, if you take an example of a JSON object, you know, for Twitter. JSON stands for JavaScript object notation. Twitter exposes their data in the form of JSON objects. So, each tweet is there in the form of a JSON and there are about 200 or 300 attributes, other attributes in a, in a JSON object. What we might be interested is in just a uh, simple example of sentimental analysis in trying to understand whether the sentiment is positive or negative and things like that. What we need is only a single field, but we have about 200 or 300 other attributes. In such case, at a large scale, when we have huge amounts of data, when we are looking at maybe an year's data or maybe two years or maybe 10 years of data, the re data really tends to get large and in such case, extracting the text is what we would like to do. Okay? It, it ends up being too verbose if it is XML and HTML and the more the data, the more the verbosity increases. Verbose format consumes much more storage and memory. So, what do we do when your storage increases, when your memory increases? Would you go ahead and buy a high powered server versus would you buy a more commodity uh, servers and try to use something like Hadoop? And HTML is a closely related type for web pages. Again, we are all familiar with HTML. It is likelier to deviate from spec and have less structure than XML. So, generally, uh, HTML has some basic structure, but does not mean that it is very perfect and things like that. Some web pages tend to violate, they may or may not have well formed HTML. Content and formatting intertwine, especially in the older documents. So, the more we get into these XML or the HTML documents, the more deeper they might get in extracting the text and it gets very complicated in extracting in certain cases. Tools such as Python and R give us certain ways of extracting and scraping this text out of them and trying to do the further analysis guys. So, that is a little bit about XML and HTML. Then we have JSON stands for JavaScript object notation. It is an alternative to XML. It is slightly less verbose. It is similar to XML, but uh, less verbose uh, than XML. It takes a slightly lesser footprint compared to XML and it offers many benefits with fewer drawbacks. It is becoming a standard practice or it is becoming a global standard of exposing the data because of the memory footprint it takes, it takes compared to the XML. Format is also hierarchical and self-describing. It maintains the data in the form of hierarchy, in the form of keys and values guys. Okay? The one on the left hand side is referred as key, the one on the right hand side is referred as the value. So, if you take a Twitter, your text might, might be the key and your actual content will end up being the value and it will maintain a hierarchical fashion. What you are looking at the screen here, ID could be referred as the key and the one on the right hand side is the actual value is what it is. Uh, it is much less verbose than XML as said, it takes much uh, lesser footprint and despite it, its JavaScript origins, it is supported by many languages and it is becoming the global standard due to the reasons stated uh, just now. 
Moving on, binary input formats. Not all data collected is text-based. Uh, we have images, which is a binary data. Then we have the spreadsheets, uh, word processor, PDF documents are again binary data. We, we then have the audio and the video data. These are all the binary input formats or binary formats of data, guys. Okay? These formats are not ideal for analysis. You take the binary data, you directly try to feed it to something like R, Python or Spark. And you, we cannot necessarily right away do some analytics. We will need to first transform the data into certain uh, ways and get, in, get it to a numerical format so that we are able to do some per, uh, advanced machine learning techniques and things like that. Okay? These formats are not necessarily ideal for analysis and uh, not natively supported by Hadoop or ecosystem tools. So sometimes we may have to write some custom input formats or custom sources. Although there are a few, there is support for a few binary input formats. Sometimes we may have to, based on our business rules, based on what our business is doing, we may end up writing custom input formats and trying to um, uh, deal with them. Analysis typically involves format specific custom code. So it depends on our input format that we have, what is the format we have, are we into the audio analysis or the video analysis and things like that. That dictates you know, how we go ahead and whether we want to reuse a standard input format or whether we need to customize it and may write a slightly advanced Java uh, input for format program for them. Often better to convert to a text-based format before processing. So generally, it's a good practice to convert, to get it, get them into a standard format so that the advanced analytics, when you come into machine learning, all these things expect a certain format and uh, they, they, they expect certain kind of textual or numerical data as input. So we need to convert and we need to come up with rules based on our requirements as to what is the format that we need to come up with and whether it's going to be textual data or whether it's going to be numerical data. Example, convert the Excel to CSV or PDF to text. That's, those are pretty straightforward examples where we are actually taking Excel and just saving it as CSV or just extracting the text out of PDF and using the text to understand what is the sentiment and things like that, a possible scenario. And this may not be possible for some formats such as images. So when you deal with images and things like that, what do you do? Images, audios and videos. We may need to get an external third party client library or a DLL and then we may need to use it, call those APIs and try to uh, use it for additional analysis. In some cases only metadata is actually needed for analysis. So in some cases we may have lots of videos and audios. In such case we may just end up using the metadata and not necessarily have to touch the content of it. We could just work with the metadata and try to come up with certain insights which might be used by the organization or the business that we are uh, working for. So that is about the data formats. Then we have the data quantity. Uh, the data quantity considerations is the defining characteristics of data science. How much quantity do we have? Do we have small amounts of data versus do we have large amounts of data? And uh, if you have small amounts of data, what are the tools that we can use? Where do we store? How do we process? Versus if it's big data, how do we store? How do we process is what we need to consider. And preliminary analysis is often best done with less data. So when we are getting started with analysis, we generally tend to start with less data and we try to understand the potential of the insights. The more the potential of the insights that we have, the, the more we try to expand to slightly bigger data and then we try to get more insights is what uh, generally happens. So smaller data sets mean faster execution times. The reason we start with smaller data sets is because uh, we are able to execute it in a quick way, in a faster way. We can do multiple iterations in a small amount of time and get some quick insights and be able to share that with the business and verify if those insights are something that the business wants that they can use in their actions and things like that. More iterations provide more opportunities to refine the solutions. Again, another reason to start with small is the more the iterations we are able to do quickly, the more the benefit it is for the business and we are able to help them in taking some decisions. So for today, we will go ahead and uh, wrap it up here and we will continue in the, the next module in the coming up uh, uh, session. So please stay tuned and thank you.